Uh, we're delighted to have Jeff Clemens from UC San Diego. Um, Michael Strain is here too, his co-author. Uh, he'll be talking about a paper, The Heterogeneous Effects of Large and Small Minimum Wage Changes, Evidence Over the Short and Medium Run Using a Pre-Analysis Plan. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, he knows he's open for questions about the whole minimum wage quest whole issue uh, to fill us in on, on that and later research. Uh, as usual, uh, he's going to start, and, and we're going to try to ask clarifying questions, and that will swiftly break down, and then, but there will be more time for question and answer toward the end. Uh, so with that, Jeff, uh, take it. Go for it. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to, um, to present this work. And uh, ha having attended the last couple of, of weeks' worth of talks, I'm, I'm aware of how things can can uh, evolve or devolve depending on how you look at it. So I'll, I'll look forward to some spirited uh, discussion as we, um, as we go. So at the top, let me just give a brief sketch for, uh, for the plan for the talk. So uh, I'll spend the first couple of slides discussing just a couple of facts from the literature. I won't, I won't dwell on the literature for too long during the front portion of the talk. But I do want to get enough on the table just to kind of to motivate two aspects of the analysis that, uh, that Michael and I have done. Um, the primary of which is our emphasis on distinguishing between the effects of relatively large versus relatively small minimum wage increases. And the second, which is complementary to that, will be our, our focus on analyzing the state minimum wage increases that have been implemented uh, in particular over the last decade in the US uh, context, whereas we'll see there's substantially more variation to work with than there has been for, for much of the historical um, literature. After that brief discussion of the literature, I'll then just move right into uh, discussing what we find and how we went about um, finding it. I suspect that that will kind of take me through the front 30 minutes of the talk, um, such that these other materials that you see in this outline um, discussing kind of how the literature's uh, many seemingly disparate results can potentially be rationalized, how it might all fit together, uh, that, that will likely just be safe for the Q&A stage of the talk um, if, if people are, are interested in, in going, uh, going down those paths. So, so first, just to open off with three, um, three facts about the literature. So, so the first fact, drawing on a uh, recent and very nice uh, literature review um, from Newmark and Shirley, is that the average employment elasticity estimate in the literature is what I think would, most would characterize as being a small um, and negative elasticity. Second, there's, there's a huge range of estimates in the literature going from small and positive to large and negative estimates of the employment effects of, win, of minimum wages. And then third, you can find you know, well-published and seemingly um, you know, highly methodologically advanced uh, papers at pretty much all segments of the, uh, the range of, of elasticity estimates. But I think it's, it's worth highlighting that there are a number of well-published recent studies you know, that are kind of in the, the camp that, that find uh, null employment effects or even slightly positive employment effects. And so in particular, it's notable that if, you know, if your reading list was exclusively consisting of papers that have been in the Quarterly Journal of Economics over the last three years, um, you know, you would be under the impression that minimum wages were in, in, in approaching uh, magical policy instrument, you know, which never has adverse employment effects, which reduces racial uh, wage disparities and, and manages to sort of reallocate workers from, from bad firms to, to good firms. And so that's kind of the state of affairs within um, the literature. And for me and for, for Michael and I in this project, this state of the literature sort of raises two, two questions. So one question is the intellectually constructive question of, you know, to what extent can the estimates in the literature be rationalized? And the second question, which is relevant in light of where the policy debate has been going, is the question of whether this kind of, you know, consensus estimates of small or near zero employment effects should be used to project the effects of a $15 uh, federal minimum wage. Great. Can I ask just a, a clarifying question? Sure. Part of what we're doing here is to catch up on all this stuff. Sure. Uh, to what extent do these uh, watch time? In other words, a month, a year, 10 years, would you think it have different effects? And are we watching overall employment, not just employment at the surviving firms that pay minimum wages? 
So yeah, so that's a great question. So, so in terms of what population is being studied, the bulk of the studies are still focusing on, you know, as, as is ours, are focusing on groups like teenagers or young adults with relatively little education. Some of the literature reviews, so not, not the Newmark and Shirley one, but some of the other literature reviews, which have a similar flavor, do an explicit effort to kind of adjust for whether you're looking at a broad population in which only a small chunk of the study group is directly affected versus analyzing a, large, a small population that is primarily uh, minimum wage workers. So you, you would get a kind of similar flavor of there being kind of a tendency towards small or you know, near zero employment effects from those meta analyses. Um, in terms of the time horizon, that's a subject of debate within the literature, I would say. So if you read the recent QJE paper by, uh, by Aaron Dubé and co-authors, which is the one that's described as analyzing you know, 138 state level minimum wage changes and finding null employment effects, they report estimates that in principle trace out effects for four or five years, which is starting to sound reasonably medium run, um, maybe you know, more or less how I would characterize it. But when, you, but when you dig into the history of all of the events and you know, as, as you know from your Stanford colleague Isaac Sorkin's work, I would, I would guess, you know that within the US experience, there's a lot of kind of ping-ponging around of a, you know, states increasing their minimum wages, followed by the federal government increasing its minimum wage, such that there aren't really that many events in which one could claim to have a clean four or five year outlook on the effects of the increases. So it's a little, you know, it's a little unclear how much data is actually contributing to our sense of medium run estimates. And that's, that's one of the things that I find very attractive about the last decade's minimum wage changes and what we're able to do in our analysis, which is that the divergence in state level policy has sort of very clearly been large and sustained for, um, for a number of, of, of years. So that's going to be an attractive aspect of what I think we're able to do in the recent historical episode. So to get back into the flow of the talk, so the, you know, so my answer to this question of have we learned what we need to know about a $15 federal minimum wage is kind of a, a clear no. But I think it's worth pointing out that if our, you know, if our Hoover hosts were to travel across the bay and attend a seminar at the, the Berkeley Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, you might show up at the right time for a talk in which it would be claimed that we know what we need to know to infer the effects of a $15 minimum wage, not just at the federal level, but indeed some of the researchers at the Berkeley IRLE have simulated the effects of a $15 minimum wage in, in Mississippi and included that such a minimum wage would actually have a small positive effect um, on employment. So the view that we know enough to project effects of a $15 federal minimum wage um, is out there. I would highlight that this is very much kind of out, of out of sample. And one way to see how out of sample this is, as to, is to look at the size of the minimum wage increases that are typical within some of the recent papers that have analyzed the long history in the US. So this figure that's at the bottom right of my slide comes from the recent QJE paper by uh, Daruk Sengiz, uh, Aaron Dubé, Attila Lindner, and Ben Zipperer. And it's the figure in which they present the average log point change in the minimum wage across the 138 historical changes that they analyze. And as you can see in, in the figure, which might require some squinting, the average increase sort of three or four years out of the policy change being enacted is just over eight log points. Okay. So that's, that's the size of an increase that would be relevant for studying the effect of going from a federal minimum wage of $7.25 to $8, or an increase of 75 cents, let alone an increase of $7.75. So the increases that are being proposed are sort of very much outside of the, the historical range. And this is going to be one of the reasons why it's attractive to conduct some analyses that focus on the state level experience of the last decade, as Michael and I do in this paper, because the variation in state level minimum wage policies over the last decade have been substantially more dramatic and also substantially more sustained in terms of the length of time that those differentials have been in place 
than most of the historical experience. So the figure that you're looking at on the right side of the slide that I'm, that I'm currently showing plots out the average effective minimum wage weighted by state populations um, across the states divided up into what we're going to use as our, the policy groupings within our empirical analysis. And so here in the blue circles, you see the states that have stuck with the $7.25 federal minimum wage throughout this time period. In the light blue circles, which might be a little faint for, for some of you, you'll see states that we've grouped based on the fact that they've updated their minimum wage rates for inflation since before this entire decade's experience got going. So interestingly, these are the only states that have any minimum wage increases at all during the very early portion of the decade, reflecting the fact that essentially that all of the other states took a break as the labor market was sort of getting its recovery going uh, after the experience of the global financial um, crisis. The other two groups of states are the groups of states that we're going to view as the states that set out on a path to enact sort of moderately sized minimum wage increases during this episode, and the states that we're going to code up as having set out on a path to enact substantial minimum wage increases over this historical episode. And you can see that these states that went on a path to enact large or substantial minimum wage increases by January 2019, which is kind of the end line for, for our sample period, had increased their minimum wages you know, by, by on the order of, of $4. The states that set out on the path to increase their minimum wages somewhat more modestly had, by the end of our sample, increased their minimum wage rates by on the order of, of roughly $2. Those $2 increases are actually quite substantial relative to the historical experience. But this is kind of importantly, really the, one of the first, arguably the first time kind of in the last few decades of minimum wage policymaking where increases you know, on the order of three or four dollars are, are on the table and where we can potentially start to learn more about the effects of genuinely large um, minimum wage increases on the labor market. So we're gonna analyze these, these variations in, in two ways, one of which is going to really get at, at the kind of the most novel feature of our analysis. And I'll say, I'll say a lot more about that in a second. But so, so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to implement what you could call the kind of uh, best practice, um, difference in differences style estimators, where best practice here, you know, for those of you who have been following the recent um, applied microeconometric literature, best practice is going to mean kind of papers that take into account some of the issues that have been raised in, in what's being called the new difference in, in differences literature. So I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to dive into the details of all that, but just want to kind of put the marker down that we've sort of you know, did, we've implemented those types of analyses um, as part of our, our robustness checks. But, but the bulk of our analysis is going to emphasize transparency and is going to have the, what, what we'll mark down as a, the scientific advantage of being based on a pre-analysis plan. So what do I mean by that? Well, what we did in this project was we had observed in the middle of the decade, so around 2015 and 2016, that it looked likely that states would in, sort of go on these strongly divergent policy um, paths. And so what we did in calendar year 2016 was we conducted an analysis of what you could view as the very short run effects of this period's minimum wage changes. And we accompanied that short run analysis with a, with a pre-analysis plan or pre-commitment to update a very standard set of difference and difference and triple different style analyses to basically extend that very short run analyses you know, with our hands tied so that we wouldn't be specification searching you know, for results that, you know, that, that fit or flattered our, our priors on what effects these minimum wage changes um, might have. So our analyses of the data that include 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 are all going to be kind of pinned down by a set of kind of robustness checks 
that you could view as, as some of the most basic difference in difference style, uh, in triple different style estimators that one could bring to the table to analyze um, the effects of these minimum wage changes. Let me, before, before getting into the data and, and the results, which, which again will, will be quite, quite straightforward uh, to present given this emphasis on, on transparency within our analysis plan, let me say just a little bit more about, about why differentiating between large and small minimum wage changes is, is, is a more important you know, empirical innovation um, than you might, might think. So innovation might sound strong, but when you think about sort of how the minimum wage literature has, has, has historically uh, looked, it hasn't been the standard to differentiate between the effects of large and small minimum wage changes. But of course, if you think about essentially any of the reasonably nuanced economic models that you might write out to think uh, rigorously about the minimum wage's effects, essentially any of those models you know, will have the implication that large and small minimum wage changes should have qualitatively different effects. Some of those models live within the perfectly competitive universe. Some of those models live within the imperfectly competitive universe. But to some degree, they, they all have the same flavor that small minimum wage changes you know, might have null or potentially even positive effects, whereas large minimum wage changes will sort of uniformly by the models you know, be predicted to have negative effects. You know, and this, this includes, for example, models in which there might be, say, a non-wage compensation margin, where there's a clear sort of avenue for firms to offset the cost increases associated with a minimum wage increase. It includes imperfectly competitive models where you might think of there as being some degree of a bargaining wedge. You know, perhaps it's a search friction, perhaps it's firm monopsony power that creates a range within which the minimum wage can have positive effects after which it will have negative effects. And then we see these forces kind of coming out very nicely in some of the recent uh, more, more sort of macro style equilibrium models of minimum wage impacts, um, which includes a, a very recent paper by, by Elena and co-authors as well as, um, as well as a nice paper by, uh, by Berger, Herkenhoff, and, and Manji. But again, it's kind of this flavor of null or potentially positive effects of small minimum wage increases, but then eventually negative effects from large increases is you know, present throughout these models. Yet historically, you know, minimum wage work has involved just regressing log employment on log minimum wage in a way that imposes a constant elasticity. More recent work, in, including ours, but also including the work of others, has had more of what you know, applied microeconomists would call an event-based uh, framework. And in these frameworks, including the frameworks that we're using in, in this paper, it's much more natural to start to consider heter heterogeneity across events in a way that I think is, um, is productive. Can I ask a question, Jeff? Oh, absolutely. Um, so let, let, let me say that, I mean, for, forget our paper where I hope micro meets macro. But one theme extrapolating from our, my co-authors and my experience in the paper is that really the name of the game is the dispersion in these effects. So forget about our paper, but if you think about a model economy like the one we are considering, and you think about an economy that is as capital intensive as the US is, what we find, for instance, is that at every level of increase of a minimum wage, you do find a subpopulations of relevant workers who benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what does it do at any meaningful level of aggregation? We're not targeting necessarily only with such a blunt instrument the sub segment of the high school dropouts in Southwest Missouri. Maybe they benefit, and we know they do, but when you start aggregating up at, at, at the level of, of, of effects that you should contemplate as a policymaker in the sign minimum wage effect, then at the level of the economy, in the medium run, you're killing capital accumulation because you impose ginormous cost when you would have another instrument like the IETC, I mean, there are much more flexible instruments that would accomplish the same outcome at a much lower uh, cost in terms of the implied disclosure to the economy. So my question to you is, uh, we want it, I want it, it's my dream to write a triple defensive paper where cleanly you have struck from all the assumptions that people like me have to make to go about measuring these effects in the aggregate. But then we get stuck in wondering, I mean, how do you account for what happens to the rest of the economy? 
Now, firms make capital decision, make employment decision, workers are forward looking. And so my attention, maybe it's more of a question for the end of the, for the beginning. I would like to go micro and micro alone, but then I am stuck with the questions, how do I account for all the effects that the diff and diff, even the most sophisticated one that you were alluding to cannot possibly account for. Sure. So where do you position yourself? I mean, the literature is very instructive the way you presented it, but how do you see yourself in this trade-off? About how the more micro accurate you want to be, the more you're left to rely on assumption how the rest of the economy responds to the changes that you're contemplating. Yeah, that's I mean, that that's a good question. And I think I think you're hitting on some of the methodological issues that you know that we're all kind of grappling with. I think that in the you know, in the historical minimum wage literature. The minimum wage, this is, I'm gonna kind of highlight it, I think a tension that applied micro folks have sort of always been grappling with just in terms of how we describe what we're doing and how we present checks for the credibility of our estimation frameworks. Um, you know, which is that historically applied microeconomists have drawn a lot on the fact that minimum wage increases have tended to be quite modest in a way that I think I think appropriately has again historically made us more comfortable, you know, viewing some large segments of the labor market or economy as a whole as being essentially unaffected by those increases, you know, such that they can be used in you know what we often describe as falsification exercises. But of course, as the minimum wage becomes a more prominent uh, policy instrument, or as a you know say a fifteen dollar minimum wage is pursued, that assumption becomes increasingly less tenable, which, which is which is problematic for the applied micro approach because it sort of chops the legs out from one of the standard um, you know standard uh, tools would have been. To, to provide a check on whether your estimator was reasonable or, or was potentially just picking up spurious things going on um, in this or that uh, in this or that labor market. So so I mean I think as the minimum wage you know is contemplated to rise to increasingly high levels that estimating its effects within the context of models that allow for you know for some of the cross industry spillovers or feedback mechanisms you know will be increasingly important for for, for the results to be sensible and interpretable um, in the first place. So I, th so I think I think that you and your co-authors and you know and and, and Berger, Herkenoff, and and, and Mongi are are coming in you know at at the right um, time, given that those are the types of minimum wage increases that are being proposed. I guess to conclude, but then we'll talk, of course, more later. Is that sure. I I was really if you can explain the way I mean, people like me would like to borrow. I mm -hmm. I, I have a micro hat is my primary hat. I like to borrow analysis like yours uh, and in a quasi-structural sense, uh, knowing the premises they're based on really feed them right. into the bigger model, but I'll understand better. Let's, Sorry. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, yeah, let's definitely plan to, dis to discuss that in more detail after the talk. Are, there, are these nonlinearities um, things that are specific to minimum wages or to wages in general? So, you know, as, as 20 years from now, wages rise for other reasons, will we go through these various nonlinear effects, or are these things specific to distorting a market with a minimum wage above whatever the equilibrium wage? Mm. Most most of what I have in mind here, at least in terms of the kind of as I've listed the various model augmentations, would be specific to thinking about a regulated floor being placed on one part, portion of uh, of compensation. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. the la The last point that I want to make, just to make sure. So sort of it's clear that this kind of differentiation between large and small increases you know is is relevant for thinking about policy debates is that when you dig into the congressional budget office reports uh, in which they've recently you know attempted to project the effects of minimum wage policy options as they put it you know including a ten dollar a twelve dollar and a fifteen dollar minimum wage their simulation model allows for a, you know a little bit of evolution of the elasticity as we go to higher and higher minimum wages, but but not much, and certainly not of the degree of you know of allowing the smaller increases to have a null or even positive effect, but then capturing the the potentially sharper negative effects for the larger increases. So, in, and again, to to come back to the type of work that um, both that we're doing, but also the type of work that Elena is doing. You know, my hope would be that that um, that this work would would contribute to potentially, you know, 
I don't know if more sophisticated is the right term, but you know, for CBO analyses that um, that that allow for for sort of more dramatic departures between what large and small minimum wage changes might do. Jeff, are you going to to uh, tell us more about the other conflating things that you're able to you that you're successful in dealing with through a double diff or a triple diff? So we'll. In, in, two, in two slides, I think it'll be the time to, to discuss sure. those issues okay. because on, so on, on the next slide, on the next slide, I'll, what I'll walk you through are the employment tabulations that would underlie what you could call an unadjusted difference in difference, triple difference estimate. And then, on, and then on the slide after that, I'll introduce sort of similarly structured tabulations, but for several macroeconomic variables that you could view as proxies for the potential, um, you know, either, you know, tailwinds that are buoying labor markets or, you right. know, or headwinds that are, that are pushing against, against them. Um, okay. So that'll be a good chance to, to talk about what we you know, may or may not have. We, this group could probably move a little faster than walking. So, okay. Trotting or running. Let's, so let's, let's trot through some, some unadjusted difference and differences uh, estimates. So, so one of the things, I guess this is coming maybe a little bit just from, from having now worked in the minimum wage literature for, you know, for, for five or six years, I, I've become increasingly frustrated that, you know, although at the end of the day, estimates in the literature can largely be described as diff and diff and triple diff style estimates, they're, they're often sort of presented in ways that are way more opaque than necessary. And so part of what we're doing in this paper is trying to make sure that it's very clear how any of the estimates that we ultimately advance connect to what would be the unadjusted difference in difference or triple difference data. So in these, in these two tables that I'm showing you now, we have the table on the left presenting ACS data, American Community Survey, the table on the right presenting current population survey data. These are the two largest household survey data sets that could be you know, used for the types of analyses that we're doing. And that's what we committed to do in our initial, um, our initial paper in this project. Columns one and two are breaking the data out by time periods. So recall that 2011 to 2013, which is in column one, is the period during which there were essentially no minimum wage changes. You know, so it's our baseline period relative to which changes in employment will be estimated. 2019, as shown in column two, is the last year of our analysis sample. So the changes from that 2011 to 2013 baseline to 2019 you know, could be viewed as our kind of medium run estimates of the effects of the minimum wage changes. And then I've divided the states into the four policy groupings, the co quote control group, i.e. the group with no increases in their minimum wages on the top row, followed by the inflation indexing states, followed by the states that had relatively modest new statutory minimum wage increases, and then the states with the large increases. So there, there are going to be two things that are where the, where the ACS and the CPS data speak with one voice, and then one grouping where the ACS and CPS speak with conflicting um, voices. And I, and I should have said, this is for the group that we're calling sort of the low-skilled group, which is 16 to 25-year-olds with less than a completed high school education. What does the number mean? What is 0.239? So that, that is the employment rate for the, for the group. So 16 to 25-year-olds with less than a completed high school education had an employment rate of 23.9% on average from 2013, 2011 to 2013 in the states that are in our control group. That's what that 23.9 means. So row three is then presenting the changes for each of the groups. And then row four is presenting what, could, what we would call the unadjusted difference in difference estimates for each of these three policy groups relative to the control group. And so the, 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 the groupings for which the ACS and CPS data speak with one voice include the states with the large increases and the states with the inflation indexed increases. In the states with the large increases, we see a differential decline of negative four percentage points in the ACS and a differential decline of negative 3.2 percentage points in the CPS. So that's where we're going to have as kind of our, you know, our basis for systematically and across our robustness checks and all this, as you'll see, finding large negative employment effects of the relatively large minimum wage increases in our sample. The 0.015 and the 0.001 are the estimates 
again, the unadjusted estimates for the inflation indexing states. So there we're finding um, you know, null effects, possibly even slightly positive effects. The economics of that is, you know, is potentially quite interesting. So you know, these are states where the increases were largely baked into the cake, so to speak, from before our analysis sample. So if you were thinking about forward-looking firms adjusting their mix of you know, labor capital and technology, those changes likely would have happened as they were coming out of the Great Recession and kind of reconstituting themselves. We then don't find evidence of negative employment effects as the incremental increases go into effect uh, during our sample. And then finally, we have the group of states with the relatively small increases. Here we find the most sort of puzzling divergence that we see between when comparing the ACS and the CPS data. So in the ACS data, there's a very small negative effect. In the CPS data, there's sort of a puzzlingly large um, positive effect. Averaging between the two and across all the specifications, you know, you'll see that the net there is a kind of small uh, positive, um, positive estimate. But again, I think it's super important to kind of lead with the set of tabulations, because at the end of the day, any estimate that somebody gives you for the claimed effects of this period's minimum wage changes is going to have to be, you know, some sort of transformation of these, of these data. And again, this is the ACS and the CPS, so it's kind of the, the bulk of the household survey data that folks might, might use to arrive at estimates. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you worry about the fact that it looks like the large increase states start out much lower than the others and you know and, and they may not be you know comparable so i mean in terms in terms of comparability the main thing that i'm you know that I'm, that we're going to worry about in the same way as you know other difference in different style studies you know would worry about these sorts of things would be is 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 the question you know would we have expected them to exhibit some differential shift and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to take a strong stand on that. Aside from noting, if anything, perhaps I would have said, well, they had more room to grow or more room yet to recover from the Great Recession, which would be a force that would lead our estimates to understate the negative um, employment effects for that group of states. But then, as as we'll see on the next slide, and let's let's just get on get on into it before Bob gets too too antsy with the discussion of the potential sources of bias in this setting. When we look at the um, at the very you know a set of macroeconomic covariates uh, or just labor market experiences for higher skilled um, individuals, what we see is that if if anything, the economic tailwinds in the states that had the large minimum wage changes were were sort of much more favorable, and you know to these. States with the large increases, you know, so Texas and Cal uh, sorry, Texas and California, California and New York loom large in terms of the population weighted estimates. So if you just kind of think about what's been going on in California and New York over this decade relative to other states, that's part of what you're going to see in these data. You see that their housing, you know, housing prices increased far more rapidly coming out of the financial and housing crisis in the states with the large increases than in other states. Per capita incomes, you know, grew by around seven and a half thousand dollars more on a per capita basis in the states with the large increases relative to the control states. And employment among sort of we could do this either with the full prime age population or further restrict to prime age adults with you know at least some college education to make sure we're looking at groups that you know that aren't plausibly affected by the minimum wage changes. Um, and we see that their employment rates kind of rose by uh, more in the states that had the large minimum wage increases relative to the states that did not. Jeff, Jeff, do you do anything sure. about either in calculating your effective minimum wage or any of these dollar figures for spatial differences in the cost of living? No, but but if you know, but when when certainly California when thinking, and New York have much higher cost of living sure. than Mississippi, for example, so. Sure. So, and, and I would, you know, I would, I would expect that to mean, you know, naturally that going from, you know, from eight dollars to twelve dollars in New York is probably biting kind of less into the real labor cost distribution than it would in, in these other states. But here, I mean, here, you know, we're it's sort of a very reduced form exercise, you know, where we're saying, look, those states increased their minimum wages on average by four bucks. The control group did not. What you're pointing out would be relevant for me thinking about. You know how far I would want to extrapolate what we see in this experience to the other states, 
Um, but we're not doing any adjustments of that sort kind of in, in the analysis as we're- well, One of the reasons for it is, I mean, sort of the obvious question, which I'm sure you'll difference when you get to your fifth or sixth difference, we'll, we'll get to, um, you know, the question, why does the state raise the minimum wage? I think Mike's question points out, you know, there's a reason why California raised its minimum wage more than sure. other states did. But of course, looking at the labor market, maybe. The other issue is, is substitution. Um, uh, you know, clearly, I'm sure you're going to get there too. Uh, this is the, the low skill group. So I think one of the prime mechanisms is not that they bought AI, uh, but they substituted to higher skilled wages. In California, there's a, a low, you know, Im illegal, uh, undocumented, sorry, immigrants are the, are an even lower uh, um, rung on the labor market. So you may be seeing substitution to this category from other categories. That's right. So so when um, so so speaking to that to that that latter point, that's actually something that uh, that John Mir, Lisa Khan, and I have uh, have studied in a paper that came out in the Journal of Labor Economics earlier this year. We find during this episode that there's kind of an, an increase in vacancy postings of requirements for a high school diploma in some mm -hmm. of these relatively low skilled jobs, um, and you and you do see some slight sort of upticks in the ACS data in the average age or education of the people who are employed in the food service um, occupations. This starts to get at one of the tensions that, that was coming up in the context of Elena's comment, which is, so when we do our triple difference estimates, the key feature of that is that we have a quote within state control group. So that has to be some skill group, ideally for which you don't think of the substitution issue as being relevant because if the employers are substituting from people in your treatment group to people in your within state control group, you're, you're double counting, you're cheating. Um, so in our baseline triple difference estimates, we're using the prime age adults as the within state control group. We get similar results if we use prime age adults with at least some college education. So we're not too worried that we're kind of being, um, that we're not too worried that we're biased by the way that we're constructing those estimates. But again, coming back to the, the previous discussion with Elena, those issues become, it, it becomes increasingly more important to think hard and in a nuanced way about those issues as we contemplate increasingly large um, and more strongly binding minimum, uh, minimum wage. Jeff, could we, could we back up and simplify? Sure. So, so the, the, the headline for this slide uh, says the minimum wage increases were bigger in, in states that that had higher income growth. So th that sounds like a factor that that would go th that would say that uh, you're you're attributing to the minimum wage in effect uh, that actually belongs to this. Anyway, can you can you can you explain what the relationship is between that headline point and how you how you get your results? Sure. So. So what, what we see in these data, and let's, let's focus in on, let me focus on the, one of the kind of cleanest variables to look at for this, for this particular claim, which would be the employment rates among college educated, you know, prime age workers, yeah. right? Okay. Not affected by the minimum wage in any meaningful sense. What we observe in the data is that employment growth for those folks was more robust in the states that also happened to have enacted relatively large minimum wage changes. And okay, so we doesn't, are, it, our doesn't that mean, doesn't that mean that, that the simple calculation is overstating the employment effect? No, it, it would mean that it would mean that it's understating the employment effect because the the kind of the, the labor market improvement in those states is is being demonstrated to be more robust than the labor market improvement in the control group. So the so the treatment group is being is actually being buoyed by these tailwinds, in a way that a best estimate would would attempt to you know oh, okay. control for. Okay. Okay. And that's and that's what we're we're claiming or what I'm claiming here in the bullet point at the bottom of bottom slide, which is that the the regression adjustments for you know for for one or the other of these proxies will tend to result in estimates that are more strongly negative for the large increases. And that's and that's what we um, and that that's what we find in our in our analyses. Let me now kind of let me now summarize sort of what we laid out in the pre-analysis plan, which is what we'll be then summarizing in the kind of bottom line results. So you know, so basically what we said was we're going to do analyses in both the ACS and the CPS data. 
that we're going to focus on two skill groups that you know might think of as relevant for studying minimum wage effects, namely these 16 to 25 year olds with less than a completed high school education, and then also a sample that includes everyone ages 16 to 21 that we call the young workers. We then pre-specified that we would, you know, that we would, we wouldn't sort of take a strong stand on exactly which macroeconomic covariates to quote control for. That we would consider, a, a, you know, a range of specifications. That we would consider both difference and differences and triple different specifications. And then there are a few things that we did that can be viewed as kind of accounting for, you know, potentially leading the, some estimates to be more like medium run estimates than small run estimates, or to account for the timing of state's minimum wage changes in, in slightly different ways. And when we average across this full set of estimates, we get the results that are summarized in table eight of our paper, which we would describe as indicating average modest employment effects, effects that are quite large for the relatively large increases, effects that are small, for the small increases and effects that are almost pinned to zero for on average for the inflation um, indexed increases. In terms of the fancier estimators that aren't part of our you know, analysis plan. You know that, what? I was gonna say that 3.4 or four percentage point reduction is really like 20% of the employment. Right? That's right. Existing so, employment rate, that's huge. That's right. So, and, and Michael, if you in, in, in two five. in two slides, I'll come to the I'll come to the elasticity calculations, which will which which will capture that. So then, then you know, one of the things that that we tend to be doing when 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 we implement some of the you know the quote sort of fancier or best practice estimators, you know, is, is looking for things like were there divergent pre existing trends in the employment patterns in the quote treatment group relative to the control group. So that's one of the things that you can see more explicitly um, when we run these event study style estimators. Additionally, what you can see as you look at the pattern for the large increases, which are captured by these uh, the circles, is that the estimated employment effects you know, get substantially more negative with the time relative to year zero, which is the year in which the first increase goes into, um, goes into effect. When you're looking at the triangles, those are the estimates for the small increases or for the states that had the inflation indexing uh, provisions. You know, you see that even as you get on four years from the date of their first increase, the estimates are basically on, on zero for the small increases. Does all this research look just at, at employment and not labor force? There, so there, is... there, there's, there are fewer labor force participation rate analyses than, than you might think, given that when we draw our diagrams, that's you know the prime one of the primary things that pops out of the theory, and I think I think the reason for that is that estimates on labor force participation just statistically tend to be noisier. So I think they've been more subject to the file drawer problem. Um, I, thought, I thought when you ask sixteen-year-olds, "Are you looking for a job?" you get very un, un uh, uh, very lawfully answers. No, not true. Not true. I've worked on that. I thought when you when you ask the sixteen year olds and when you ask their parents, you get very different answers. So we haven't. Well, first we haven't, of all, you don't. You don't. That's that's a misunderstanding of the CPS. You don't ask the person. You ask. You, you know the, the most common re respondent is is a woman, a, a mature woman. But anyway, that's a we don't we don't get side. But anyway, okay. so in other words, what, one theory of of what goes wrong in a labor market that where the wage is elevated is that you get uh, people queue up for jobs and, right. and it has an effect on unemployment, not on, on, that's why, so that if you combine that, you look at the labor force or you could look at the unemployment right. separately, but right. it seemed like, but is there, I, I know that you're a labor economist and labor economists always say, labor economists only look at EPOP, which is what you're looking at. That's what we're and, looking at. <laughs> Although Bob, so so Bob, I will I will parry back by noting that if if some of the adjustments to the minimum wages you know are on the fringe benefits or you know other non compensation yeah. attributes of jobs that can that can overturn or or push against the labor force participation um, prediction. I want to cheer Bob on on this. I mean, a lot of the public policy story yeah. is. You by raising the wage, you get more people to choose to go look for jobs. I mean, that that supply curve effect is a lot of 
Isn't that a lot of what people say, the advantage of, of higher minimum wages? Yes, and and I think I mean I know I know that there are a couple of studies out there recently that are that in, that include the labor force participation margin or or a measure of of of, of search self reported search, obviously because how else do you get that information? I guess you could do applications, um, but the you know so I I think I think people are turning to that. They we recognize as labor economists that that is an important prediction on which we should be pursuing data, but I think I think that segment of the literature is just kind of still in its infancy. So definitely room for more. It's well work. measured. It's well measured in the CPS. Maybe so. I mean, that I may, I may just be saying then that people find the results to be to be noisy. So we're back to the file drawer problem. Yes. Okay. But but people are certainly are certainly thinking about it. Um, okay. Let me let me summarize the elasticities now. So table ten is where we take our employment effect estimates along with the changes in wages and we convert um, into elasticities. It's become kind of standard in the literature to do both elasticities with respect to the minimum wage itself. So percent change in employment divided by percent change in the minimum wage, but then also to do a kind of scaling for how intensively impacted were the individuals in the sample you chose to analyze. And that's, that's kind of what's captured by this own wage elasticity um, concept. And so here, here, um, Michael is where uh, Boskin is, is where you can kind of see that, you know, that that indeed at that 3.4 percentage point decline for this 16 to 25 year old with less than a high school education group, you know, translates into quite a substantial um, elasticity uh, estimate. Okay, so I, you know, I think I think I pretty well summarized the overall results. Let me let me just give you kind of as as a last thing to say before um, shutting down the presentation and and turning to full Q and A. So my, you know, my, my general assessment of the, of the recent literature is that although the results do look disparate and although when people sort of turn to the policy space, they give, you know, some pretty aggressive interpretations of what's gone on in various papers estimates. My sense is that a pretty standard set of labor market factors are capable of going a long way towards rationalizing a lot of the disparate, seemingly disparate estimates in the literature. So in particular, you know, my reading is that when papers find null or small employment effects, and occasionally those employment effects being you know, modestly positive, that that's more or less in line with what we should expect if we believe that there is you know, some, some at least modest degree of um, you know, a firm market power or of search frictions kind of creating some room for the minimum wage to, you know, to potentially do, do some, some good. But that, that's also what we would expect if we just broadened our attention on the attributes of jobs to include fringe benefits that can be scaled back in response to minimum wage increases or factors like um, firms kind of ratcheting up effort requirements which interestingly is something that's been, been um, found in a couple of very nice uh, recent papers, one in the Journal of Labor Economics, one currently under revision at the Journal of Political Economy. So research in this space is, you know, is, is finding evidence that some of these nuanced margins of adjustment um, are, are relevant. And I think that they go a long way to rationalizing things that we've seen in the literature. The last issue would be you know, the dynamics of adjustment um, costs which would be you know, very consistent with what we see in terms of the growing effects with time from the minimum wage increase. And I think also consistent with, with a pretty rich set of findings um, from the literature on which I'll, you know, I'll follow up after the talk, I suppose, with people who want to learn more about the, 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 the factors that lead me to, to that conclusion. But to me, the, the body of literature is ultimately um, you know, more, more coherent and rationalizable than I think. Um, than I think many folks uh, per perceive it to be. But the bottom line implication, you know, as far as our analysis goes and as far as the Congressional Budget Office style analyses go, is that the evidence suggests that the effects of large minimum wage changes, you know, will indeed tend to be much more strongly negative um, than the effects of, um, of relatively small minimum wage changes. Do you have your own uh, favorite number for the $15 federal minimum? I have no. I have definitely not. I've I've not tried to do that extrapolation yet. So I would, you know, I, I'm I, I would push back against the effort to claim that we know what we need to know, you know, to assess a fifteen dollar minimum wage in Mississippi. 
I would even note, I would even note that that you know so our analyses are likely sufficient to you know to to have reasonable assessments perhaps of a twelve or thirteen dollar um, minimum wage, but to get to get an estimate of a fifteen dollar minimum wage over the long run, you know I would I would want to see data on states going all the way to fifteen, but then also see how that unfolds over a period of labor market you know churn. So that we could really feel like we were getting a sense of how the full set of adjustments to labor capital and technology, um, you know, are are playing out in the long run equilibrium. But you you could resolve this by displaying your personal probability distribution um, posterior uh, on the fifteen dollar number. It just it has some dispersion on those accounts, but it must still be there. I guess so. Okay, so maybe you'll, maybe you'll maybe you'll push me to to do that. Maybe maybe after I confer with Elena after the talk, we'll have some ideas on how on how might one might go about this. I think you know. So one of the issues that would that would currently hold me back from this, which does which relates to some of the things Elena was talking about, is that um, you know we've we've pur purposefully focused on the population subgroups that are you know that are most directly impacted by the minimum wage increases. When you're thinking about the $15 minimum wage, you know, it'll be important to think about the fact that that the effects for those very low skilled folks are going to get increasingly dire. Um, but at the same time, as you start to move through what you might call like, you know, a thicker segment of the productivity distribution, the folks who are potentially in that range where maybe they are becoming more likely to search for jobs or be positively affected. You know, that's that there's going to be a segment where that's where that's a relatively thick chunk of the labor market. Um, and so I, I would want to think pretty carefully through how I expect those impacts to play out before before trying to deliver an overall assessment. But I guess I'm I'm happy for now to say that, you know, that if you know we're we're finding effects as negative as what we're finding for minimum wages that we're pushing in our sample up into the $12 range. Okay. I would expect well, things to get much worse for the very low skilled folks with um, with a fifteen dollar minimum wage. How about how about presenting a an overall aggregate number for twelve dollars? Then I could be. That would, that would I just want to do it, Bob. This is macroeconomist <laughs> me, macroeconomist right? speaking, right? I'd, I'd like the macro bottom line. Could I could I ask your um your numbers did not distinguish across states for how many of these people the minimum wage actually binds, right? Um, which is in mean, California, fewer of them they're going to bind in other places. I also wanted to know when we when we answer Bob's question, to what extent um, do we worry here about external validity? Um, you know, I know the story for the famous Pennsylvania thing. What went wrong is, of course, it was the taco stands that got wiped out, so there was a shift in demand to McDonald's, and that's right. why the overall state employment didn't really go up. But I, once we've triple, quadruple, quintuple dipped, diffed and added a whole bunch of controls, um, I can't quite think to the effect, but, but raising it for the whole country seems to make a, a, a difference relative to the tiny uh, fraction of, of uh, exogenous variation that we see in, in one of these numbers. So in terms of external validity, um, there, right, there could be there could be implications of thinking about a fifteen dollar federal minimum wage. You know, would basically be shutting down. You know, the extent to which some portions of the country could be viewed as a place for low skilled industries to to flock in response to labor costs elsewhere. Um, the issues. The issues that I've tended to worry about more as you know as an applied microeconomist for external validity are, are the are the issues associated with short run, medium run, long run. So I would highlight that the period that we had pre-committed to analyze, you know, ended at the end of, of a decade-long uh, labor market expansion. I think we had, you know, when we started this project in 2015 and 2016. People were saying that a recession was right around the corner. We, at least some people were saying that. We had kind of imagined that by committing to doing the analysis through 2019, that we might pick up a period of substantial labor market churn. And that turned out not to be the case. Um, so we had hoped that we would be talking about this as our view of the estimates of the long of, of reasonably long run effects. 
Um, but in, because it remained an expansion, I would characterize them as probably more like medium, um, medium run effects. So state, state dependence is going to be an issue. Yeah. State hey, dependence Jeff, of research. Jeff, have you thought about looking at any differences between right to work states and union states? We haven't incorporated that into this analysis, but we, but we have, we have been thinking about the right to work states because there was some interesting, there was some some movement on right to work laws during, during this decade. So it's, it's something that we would have potential to look at. Um, do you do you have, do you have predictions? I guess beyond I just the, any, the intuition. I don't have, have any strong priors. There's also this um, union. Uh, traditional unions have have usually pushed for higher minimum wages, which I think is mostly interpretable as they think that will help them get wage increases themselves rather than concern for, for people lower down. Um, but I think it just be, it would be interesting. And it's, you know, it's maybe uh, John Cochran's fifth or sixth difference, but you know, it's <laughs> to, to be clear, we, we, we kept ourselves to three differences. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, don't make fun of this. The regressions have, have controls in them too, though, right? That, that's they are, right. They are it, controls. Yeah, you can well, you can have a control for right to work states. Absolutely. But in, so, so but something that I do I do because I, I know it does some. This is sort of exactly the issue that I worry about with a lot of minimum wage studies is that things begin to become you know so opaque that an outside observer looking in on the literature might feel like they have no idea what's actually underlying the estimates. That's why I, I think it is crucial, you know, so, I mean, we've all, we've long been aware that sticking a macroeconomic very, you know, a state by time varying macroeconomic variable into a regression probably shouldn't be called controlling for the factor. Um, we've long been aware of that, uh, but we still do it. Um, and part of what I'm trying to get out of the kind of the transparency of our approach in, in this paper is is to be able to tell you, you know, okay, I added this variable in. Here's how much my point estimate shifted relative to the unadjusted tabulations, and then we could talk about whether that was a plausible impact, you know, based on what was going on with the macroeconomic variable and the control group relative to the treatment group. So we we try to keep it so that we can always trace back our interpretation of what's going on in the data to, you know, to the unadjusted data. Uh, Jeff, I can, if I can chime in here, I was curious uh, uh, from the paper, what is the, if you can expand on yours and Michael's uh, uh, thoughts about this one a big issue. So there are three big issues here. Let me summarize uh, in the literature that I see. So we want to extrapolate to large from small. We want to know in the long run, not just in the short run, and there are feedback effects because this, uh, this minimum wage increase is trickled down by a substitution to different worker types uh, over and above the group that is uh, meant to be targeted by the instrument. Mm -hmm. So your construction, I wanted to understand it, if you could help us understand it better. So your approach is to you, and the data, of course, the data is not experimental, it's observational, so we don't have experiments, I mean, on wages, so four big issues. But your point, if I understood it, is that you can use a, a pre uh, plans analysis, let's say, to extrapolate from the short run to the long run, and that can help circumvent at the same time the large change question as well as the short versus medium long run questions or issues. Can you talk about those? You didn't have the time to talk about it during the talk. I'm not so. We we might have a slight misunderstanding on what I'm on on what I think we were, were able to do in the data. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of in terms of short versus medium run, I take that as Chris. what we can potentially learn about by, you know, so 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 the changes go into effect, and then we can trace employment changes out, you know, in our sample for five years relative to when. The minimum wage changes first started to go into effect. So when I say I think that we're able to distinguish between short and medium run effects, all I'm saying is is we can look at the estimates as they had evolved through 2019 and compare them to the estimates as they had evolved through 2015 or 2016. We're not doing anything to to further project. You know, projecting further would require um, you know using you know using a model to have some assessment of what additional oh i see because i was thinking i mean, 
following up on what Bob, Bob, Bob Hawke was saying, is that you, if you use the pre-plan analysis as mm -hmm. a way of specifying an empirical probability distribution over outcomes that help you identify a set, get a set identified uh, type of results on the implication over the horizon that you actually see, uh, which is people doing IO in counterfactual analysis, for I instance. See. Is this something that is possible to, to, to do, you think? Have you thought about it? Because right, there not, is either I'm you extrapolate, sure. think, say yeah. the old fashioned, right? You extrapolate out of what you see and we don't mm -hmm. like it. But then another, another approach, again, is more of, but it's a counterfactual evaluation what happens after larger effects in the long run. And in IO it's very popular and you, it's exactly pretty much what I described, that you take the pre, the sample analysis, your pre-plan analysis, you call it, as informative about the possible outcome distributions. And you use the sample to uh, specify different probability distribution over the pre-plan outcomes. And you use them to trace out the potential set of effects post sample, post minimum wage, et cetera. I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. Well, so what, I mean, what we observe in, in the short run analyses that were not based on a pre-analysis plan, you know, I, I would, um, I interpret that as being very, you know, very, very short run impacts. And, and I, I expect the, um, I expect, you know, firms adjustments to their capital stocks and production technologies to lead medium and long run effects to be larger than than small run effects and because of that i'm i i wouldn't i would i personally i personally wouldn't be you know just based on on my priors i wouldn't be inclined to view the short run estimates as as delivering a strong prediction about what would take place over the longer time horizons so i so i think the answer is that i wouldn't be comfortable doing um doing an exercise of that sort and I guess I'm not sure if this will be a useful comment to make, but I think we're, in terms of what we were attempting to do methodologically here, you know, yeah. it's sort of very in this kind of, in the sort of spirit of trying to make an observational study closer to an experimental study, you know, which of course is, is if anything, tends to be getting away from being a model driven exercise. Right, so it's, so it's ratcheting up the transparency and the hopefully the reproducibility by tying your hands from specification search, you know. But then you're also subject to the same critiques that people are subject to when they, you know, when they do experiments, which is which is that you lack the flexibility <laughs> to do right. some of the things that you might have wanted to do if you weren't tie if you weren't tying your hands in that way. If I could add, um, so on the question of why do uh, governments raise minimum wages? Uh, I think your only control was the employment of high skill people. Uh, so, you know, if, if the story is the government sees low skill people get more jobs, it says good, time to raise the minimum wage. Um, we've controlled for that if low skill and high skill demands move exactly the same, but, but not if they don't move the same, right? Do, do people worry about the endogeneity of, of choosing of the minimum wage choice here? For, for sure. So, and that's, you know, so that's, so this, this puts us into the way that, we, that, that applied microtypes, you know, talk about the quote, parallel trends assumption for difference and differences style analyses. And, you know, of course, we, you cannot directly check for the possibility that the increase was timed perfectly with, you know, with a, a favorable shock for the group that you're studying, but you can check for, you know, for whether they had exhibited some sort of differential trend um, prior to the, the enactment of the policy or, or prior to, to the legislation. And that's, that's about as good as it, you know, as good as it gets in. You in pretty the much said that they do, that in the, you know, 2008, I forget, it was 2008 to 2012, nobody raised minimum wages because they saw the labor markets were a disaster. Low skill labor markets started getting better. So they said, okay, time, time to start pushing in on the minimum wages more. But the low skill, but right, but the low skilled labor market was was improving similarly in the states that did increase their minimum wage rates relative to those that didn't. And that's that's where the to the extent that you find you know any of these program evaluation style exercises plausible, that's where that's where the plausibility kicks in. If you know, if it had been the case that the Californias and New Yorks of the world had 
had you know gangbusters teenage employment you know during the 2011 to 2013 period then we would have been you know we would have been out of luck and wouldn't have started on this project in the uh, in the first place do you do you know what happened in the covid recession uh, you, you said i mean i i know you didn't you you pre, you pre-registered only to 2019 mm-hmm. but uh, we, we had the great what foresight. Was your forecast to know that bigger that minimum that. wages were were worse when the next recession came. Although this was a kind of unusual recession, uh, did that did that bear out at all? So we we haven't done that update yet. the um, The twenty twenty public use American community survey file should be coming out shortly. It lags a little. It lags more than you might than you might expect. The CPS data are certainly out there, but we we haven't extended our analyses. We also know the blue states locked down and screwed things up more. Right. So, uh, I mean, my, I think that um, my sense is, I mean, my sense is that if, if you if you ran the, the difference in differences analysis, the fact that the blue states locked down more would likely, you know, lead you to, you know, somewhat spuriously find that the effects got way worse. But then if, but if you did the triple difference analysis, I think it would go in the other direction because the prime age employment in the blue states took, you know, took a real dive. Um, so uh, I'll just say one should think very carefully about what the preferred estimator would be to, to try to bring the COVID experience into the, into the analysis. I think it'll be more interesting maybe to look at, you know, the, the 20, 20, well, who knows when we're going to be back to everyone's definition of full employment, <laughs> but you know, it, it might be that the 2021 and 2022 data will be when you would really want to say, okay, we're out of COVID. The restaurants have completely overhauled their production technologies. You know, where where does teen employment stand? I think that'll that'll be interesting to look at. But a couple of years, teen employment, teen employment has done very well and right uh, in, so far in COVID. So uh, don't give up on it. And let me ask you a uh, ready question, Jeff. So isn't a way, aren't we away at a moment of reckoning? Uh, I mean, not only economically, methodologically, so econometrically and economically, that we need to understand the basics of how you decide once you change artificially the relative price of labor, who you hire. And for mm-hmm. that, we need information about, as John and others were saying, substitutability among workers, I mean, finely defined according to their characteristics. So you said that there are, you mentioned there are a few papers you seem to like about measuring the importance of adjustment costs for the impact on the minimum wage. But don't we really need to break the mold of labor only and try to integrate labor and IO? We need to understand better production at the firm level. We need that kind of data to make more pointed predictions about the impact of minimum wages. I, I, complete, I completely agree. Um, and I think, I, I think that the introduction of some of the more, you know, I, IO and macro style approaches is is going to, you know, make this a, a literature that's actually enjoyable for people to continue um, make to, progress. You know, really, consuming. And, and, yeah, and just yeah, just perhaps full stop to make um, to make progress. Uh, yeah, so I completely. Agree what what with do that. you like? What were There's, the papers you liked exactly about adjustment costs? I mean, where over, do you see the, the consensus sure. being? Let me. Let me quickly bring the. So there, so it's kind of it's kind of a collage of facts across across a variety of papers, which would sort of point in the direction of you know thinking that adjustment costs are likely relevant. So, so for example, there are a couple of papers that use what you could call longstanding discontinuities in age-based minimum minimum wages, where the nice feature there is that. If you're looking at, if your estimates are based on a longstanding discontinuity, you've got a better shot at saying we're looking at, you know, the long-run labor market equilibrium response to this policy. And the the Kreiner, Reck, and Scove paper, which was published in Restat, studies uh, the Danish context, you know, using some of the highest quality data you could imagine studying, finds a quite a large um, differential in the employment rates of the people who are just above and below the, the age cutoff. So that would be, you know, that would be one. The Mir and West job, you know, job growth versus job levels paper would be another. I find these sorts of stories with adjustment costs to be relevant for making sense of the the totality of the Seattle minimum wage study, as well as some of the papers 
in which we've seen that in the early half of the 2010s, you know, to the when papers do have the ability to look at things like hiring standards or to differentiate between the hiring and the firing margins, you know, they, things look sensible in the sense that during an expansion, you know, firms don't start firing a bunch of workers when the minimum wage goes up by a couple of bucks. They, what they do is they start to shift things on the hiring side and, you know, maybe hire slightly higher skilled people or, or just slow down their hiring a bit if they are a firm that's likely to, um, you know, to contract over the long run. And then, and then of course I have to, to reference how I got into this literature in the first place, which is that when I studied increases that went into effect in the context of a period of substantial churn, the effects, you know, looked more negative than when I've turned to study, um, you know, things during this recent economic expansion. You know, so, so, so I, just to come back to something I was saying earlier, you know, I think, I think there are a lot of commentators and perhaps economists as well who look at these sets of estimates and then put them alongside the, the null effect estimates from, you know, from some of the other work and think that it's all a big mess, but, but I, I find it pretty straightforward to, you know, to tie it all together um, when you consider the fact that some of those, the most important papers with the null effects, you know, are studying this historical experience where the average minimum wage increase is, is eight log points, you know, so it's not, uh, it's not a big, um, a not, a, not a big mover of, of um, you know, firms technology uh, production technology decisions and things things of that nature. So these are the these are the facts that I um, the main facts that I have in that I have in mind. At least from you know, and these are from from papers just over the last couple of years. So if you one went back into the longer history, um, you might get an even richer picture. And then what else? My last question is, and what else do we like about the, do we like? Uh, and let me put it rhetorically put about the minimum wage beside the fact that it's not a commitment on a government to dole out dollars. What is your, I mean, my reading of the literature is that, and I'm curious about yours, of course, is that, uh, yes, there's, there's political reasons for why it's appealing. It's a simple instrument. I mean, the government doesn't have to pay anything, so to speak. Um, but the argument that it counts an enormous erosion of the tax base in the medium run. Um, it's simple, you explain it. And uh, according to the literature, labor literature, we all know it has, almost no employment, adverse employment effects, but which you showed us is being debunked and it is increasingly being debunked depending on the changes you consider. Yeah, what else is good about it? Yeah, now that's so, it. What, oh. why, why are we so, still so fascinated by it? Isn't the answer that it transfers employment from an unfavored group, recent immigrants, very low skilled people, racial minorities to um, low skill, but uh, full-time working, uh, you know, the, the characters that the politicians bring up when they say, oh, there's a full-time, you know, single mom who's working 40 hours a week and needs to, uh, you know, take care of her kids. That's exactly who benefits from the substitution of minimum wage. Yeah, so so I think I think my my answer would would build on what which would have two parts, one of which builds on what John was saying, um, you know, which is, and I can actually augment this a little bit with some of the other work I've done with with Michael Strain, um, which, which is that the, you know, it seems like it's kind of a savvy, uh, you know, there's a savvy political strategy involved. What the thing that Michael Strain and I have studied, you know, using, using data is, is, is news coverage of the minimum wage events from this last decade. And one of the interesting facts from news coverage is that news articles that are about labor unions become more likely to be news articles that link labor unions and minimum wage changes in the months you know, when states are debating minimum wage increases in the legislature or the months when the minimum wage increases are going into effect. So I think there's a political economy story to be told there about who gets credit for when wages are growing in the economy. Um, and as a political interest group, it's, it's a pretty savvy thing to get yourself linked up to, to that. The other, the other thing, which which is just building on the, you know, the the theme of redistributing without, um, without the government spending money, is that I, I think that's I think that is a powerful force, um, in part, be, you know, because it it connects across a couple of the domains in which in which I do research. So yes, just yesterday I was lecturing to my undergraduates on health economics, and we were talking about the Affordable Care Act, and you know, within the Affordable Care Act, 
the most popular provisions of the entire law in public opinion are the pre-existing conditions regulations, right. which again, it's a, it's a redistributive price regulation, which sticks it to the insurance companies. Um, and, you know, that's more, po that's more popular than, than large subsidies or free public insurance. And, and obviously all of that's more popular than the mandate, um, you know, which was the one thing that was really designed to help pay for, you know, pay for stuff. So I, th I think that those political economy factors are probably a big part of the the picture, you know, coupled with the real factor of people, you know, having more appreciation perhaps today than 20 years ago of, uh, of the, the labor market frictions and the issues that, you know, that, that can make at least the smaller minimum wage changes a potentially reasonable uh, policy. I would never underestimate the interest of a legislature in finding ways to do things or to satisfy constituents that don't cost money directly uh, because that, then that puts pressure on the other things they want to spend on or have to raise taxes for. We saw this uh, in the run-up to the Great Recession and housing policy where we were just going to put all these all these restrictions on, et cetera, that just increase the risk. You know, banks had to lend and have a fraction of their investments and low-income housing and blah, blah, blah. And landlords. <laughs> think, think of the burdens we put on landlords. Yep. Just in the last year. A, a bit of a we, we forget there's a budget constraint with time too. There's a whole bunch of other policies that want to subsidize 16 to 25 year olds to go to school. Free community, well, free community college is going to lower employment. That's the whole point. Um, so I, I mean, I guess there's some vision that they're sitting in mom's basement playing video games and could be gotten out of there, but. Just, just what are they? But what's the substitution? Is a good question here. That's it's interesting. Going back to your point, John, uh, that uh, in fact, in all all of the countries, they went very quiet. Italy was one of those. Many European friends who were very vocal. I mean, I have friends of the European Commission about greater minimum wage in countries like Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, Greece, where the degree of formality of the economy is non-trivial. It's even when we changes are never advocated anymore because the substitution was dramatic. Nobody collects tomatoes in southern Italy that was an Italian anymore, and the increase even on wage and the employment plummeted among those guys. Well, Marie Christine just sent me a text reminding us all that it's uh, time to go. Time to wrap up. So thank you so much, Jeff. That was a great, great yeah. talk. Thank, Michael, thanks, everyone. Thank That's really interesting. Michael, good to see you again, too. Great, great job. Yeah.